introduction and I'm actually going to stop sharing. So John, if you want to go ahead and start sharing yours and then Jack, go ahead and go with your intro. Okay. Um, as he said, Dr. John, John Worth is a professor of historical archaeology in the Department of Anthropology at the University of West Florida in Pensacola. He's conducted archaeological and ethnographic research or ethnohistorical research for more than three decades in the southeastern U.S., primarily focusing on the interactions between Native Americans and Spaniards during the colonial era in Florida and Georgia. <coughs> His uh, background research has been in all of the local re uh, resources, but uh, he also spent uh, several seasons uh, working in, in Spain in the archives of the Indies and uh, uh, resources in Madrid, in Madrid, excuse me, uh, Seville and Madrid. He's also worked in uh, Havana and um, in Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> please excuse me. <clears throat> uh, his focus has been on the Temuqua and other tribal groups in North Florida and South Georgia. Um, he has a, a, an impressive uh, list of, of, of publications, um, but I wanted to point out that he's a native North Georgian um, he began in archaeology as a high school volunteer with Dr. Roy Dickens at Georgia State University. Uh, he did, when he went to college, he went to uh, the University of Georgia, where he received his BA and his MA the same week, wasn't it? Same day. Like that. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> since he had uh, uh, drained Dave Holly and Charles Hudson and Steve uh, Kovaleski, of all the best they could give him, they sent him off to Florida to get his doctorate. That's uh, and his, uh, his, his papers include things like the discovering of Florida, the first contact narratives of Spanish expeditions along the lower Gulf Coast, the Temuquan chiefdoms of Spanish Florida, and the struggle for the Georgia coast. That's published in 1995 and 2007, but I think he's really talking about the 16th century. Okay, there's more than 200 other professionals and, and, uh, and lay publications and papers and so on, uh, but um, I guess I'm a little biased. I think that John is probably one of the true geniuses in our field oh, at this time. Um, he seems to be able to do everything at a very, very high level. And so I have no doubt that what he will present tonight will be outstanding. Welcome, John. We're glad to have you. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, Jack, that's probably the anyway, best introduction I've ever been given, I think. <laughs> You're very <laughs> I want to thank you all for inviting me and uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, even though I don't get up to North Georgia much, it's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, grew up there. So, you know, even though I'm a Floridian now, I, I still remain a Georgian at heart. So um, I guess I'll proceed and check on my time. I, I have uh, introductory stuff. I'm going to touch a little on the uh, underwater archaeology, too. And then at the end of this, I'll kind of wander our way through some of the finds, the archaeological, the artifact finds that we've made as well. So uh, some of these slides I'll talk a little more about than others. Um, anyway, uh, the connection, there is a connection between what the Luna settlement is here in Pensacola and uh, North Georgia generally, because Ultimately, some of Luna's men uh, went up and stayed six months over toward Calhoun. So there's artifactual traces of Luna's expedition way up there in North Georgia. But of course, uh, the, the mother load, as it turns out, is right here on Pensacola Bay. Um, so that's what I've been working on and I'll give you some context for here. This map shows all the major Spanish expeditions, the, the official ones that penetrated the interior and, and kind of cruised along the coast of uh, the southeastern U.S. in the pre-Tristan de Luna period. Um, there's a lot of expeditions, and of course, uh, the De Soto expedition is obviously the most uh, famous, I suppose, of, of all of them, at least in, in the interior. What's important to note, though, is after all of those expeditions, um, which were privately financed but royally um, permitted, essentially given tax breaks, etc., at the end of all that period, despite Spain's advances all over the central, uh, even northern South America and in the Caribbean, uh, Spanish colonial presence had never actually, a, a foothold had never been established in the southeastern U.S. So uh, Florida, La Florida, was 
which includes more than just the, the state of Florida, of course. Uh, Florida was unoccupied by the Spanish. When I say unoccupied there, of course, I'm not actually talking about all the hundreds of thousands of Native Americans who lived there uh, at the time. But from the Spanish perspective, they needed uh, Florida for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was that Havana, Cuba, was the staging ground for all the treasure fleets that came back to the old world. And therefore, the Florida Straits and between the Bahamas and the uh, southeast coast of Florida was very, very important. And so Spain desperately desired to have a colonial presence. So the plan was that the, the king himself, would uh, Philip II, would actually finance a massive expedition. Um, hundreds of thousands of pesos were spent. This was the first time the expedition was actually fully, well, almost fully uh, financed by the Spanish crown. Um, and so the plan at least was to go from Veracruz in New Spain or modern day Mexico, uh, establish a, a landing site an initial colony at Pensacola Bay, which was actually discovered by the Spanish during the uh, Soto expedition back in 20 years before that. And they knew Pensacola Bay was a good spot and then they were going to march overland to the chiefdom of Cusa. And then they were going to follow the Soto route all the way back down toward the coast. And eventually their plan was to make a, a colony at Santa Elena, which they didn't really know that well. But we now know once it was eventually established is Paris Island, South Carolina. So, so that was the plan. This is the actual route as they ended up taking to get here. Um, the, the little hook in the route is mainly because the only way they knew how to get to the northern Gulf Coast and to the Bay of Ochuse was to go to a specific dangerous shoal just off Yucatan. So they had to get there using currents and then they had to shoot straight north. Anyway, long story short, it took them many weeks to finally arrive in Ochuse and they took 1500 colonists with them, uh, 500 soldiers and a couple of people per soldier additionally including Aztec warriors, and some of them brought their families. But the main plan was to do this overland expedition with all these 500 soldiers. So uh, to make a very long story short uh, here, uh, once they landed, they had about five weeks. They first picked out the site they were going to locate their initial settlement on and then stage and move inland. But a hurricane came five weeks later and caught them unawares. Um, since they had not finished building the main terrestrial site or the warehouse, so they didn't have a really good safe spot on land to store all their food supplies, they offloaded all the people and the equipment to build the colony, but they left all their food on their fleet and the fleet was at anchor. And of course the hurricane came, uh, I found some documentation that shows that it devastated San Juan, Puerto Rico seven days earlier, but of course they didn't have radar or weather channel or Jim Cantori. So Ultimately, the hurricane hit them in the night. It ran for 24 hours and it absolutely devastated everything. Um, there were 10 ships afloat in the bay and after the hurricane, there were only three afloat. All the rest, uh, six of them sank or were driven ashore and one of them actually was driven on land in a, in a grove of trees where they were able to salvage it. So uh, from an inst in an instant, in 24 hours, the 1,500 people were left with virtually no food uh, and pretty much destitute and very little transportation. And yet they had a royal order to, to continue. And Luna had mortgaged a lot of his property to, to continue the expedition. So he was in no mood to surrender to the forces of, of nature. So ultimately, this is sort of a schematic map that just shows you the relief expeditions, uh, Luna uh, immediately sent uh, one ship back to Veracruz, another ship to Havana uh, in search of quick supplies so that they could get food. Uh, and they did indeed get some relief supplies back that fall of 1559. However, it turns out that there wasn't enough, had too many people, they were eating too much food, not enough supplies were available for the reliefs. So ultimately they ended up moving inland uh, to central Alabama southern and central Alabama, uh, and eventually some of them went up to Coosa in North Georgia. The reason they moved was to get food. They knew that Native Americans, the southeastern Indians, had surplus food in some places. But the coast, the Gulf Coast of Florida, the northern Gulf Coast, is not an area that has a lot of surplus food, and the Native groups here weren't serious farmers, or at least they didn't do enough farming uh, here to, to supply surplus to the Spanish. 
So this is a map that just shows uh, details of where uh, the route that Luna's men took to initially explore. They actually thought Pensacola Bay drained the river that went up to Coosa. It took them several expeditions to figure out that that was not the case. Uh, and ultimately, you'll see that they, they moved the entire colony, save about 100 people, up to the central Alabama area um, called Piachi. The town was called Manipacana. And then from there, they ended up going uh, 200 men out of the 1,000 that were inland. Uh, 200 men went up to North Georgia, where they actually spent about five months, four or five months, living among the Kusa, who were actually fairly friendly. Um, although just a few years later, they slaughtered, led the slaughter of all the Spaniards who who'd moved inland six years later. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, the point though is that the Kusa for now at that moment were um, accommodating. But the Spaniards in the interior, I've recently found documentation that is not in any published account, uh, not in the Luna papers or any of the other books, but some of these accounts make it really clear that the Spanish uh, were wearing out the welcome of the native groups. And so the, the native groups in central Alabama pretty quickly began to actually directly attack them. So uh, they would attack fleets of war canoes um, and they would shoot arrows at them whenever they were up and down in the river. Um, so you can see the specific locations where some of these battles occurred. So ultimately after about four or five months in the interior, the main colony moved back to where we are today here in Pensacola. Uh, so then later, mon many months later, about a year after they first left, uh, the 200 men came back from Cusa. So all of those sites uh, are poorly known and not well documented at best. Um, we think we know where the main town of Cusa was at Little Egypt uh, in the re-regulation reservoir under uh, near Carter's Lake today. But some of these other towns in central Alabama, we really can't say for 100% sure where they exactly are. But a thousand Spaniards moved in for about four months. So there ought to be a signature somewhere. Uh, it just hasn't yet been identified. Uh, sorry, uh, here, there's a slide. Um, after the expedition failed, essentially, they spent two years as the, the population gradually dwindled. Uh, there were a series of four relief fleets that ultimately brought food and took some of the sick and, you know, the ones that were just not going to be of any particular use more. So at the very end, Luna was deposed. Uh, the Viceroy sent a new governor, uh, Angel de Villafane, uh, and he picked up most of the survivors and the soldiers went to Havana and then set off to achieve the original mission of the, uh, of the uh, king, which was to settle at Santa Elena. And they sailed up there just basically got offshore, looked around a little bit, cut a couple of crosses in trees and decided it really wasn't worth the effort. And so they continued on north and a hurricane struck them again up off Virginia or North Carolina. And they had uh, two big ships and two small frigates uh, right behind being towed. Both the frigates went down with all hands uh, somewhere off the North Carolina coast. And those other two, two vessels made their way back eventually to the Caribbean. So they evacuated the colony and uh, the Pensacola settlement, the Luna settlement was evacuated after basically two years of continuous, although fluctuating population, uh, continuous occupation. Mm -hmm. All right, so if you're hearing noises, by the way, I have uh, <clears throat> our pet parrot uh, who will be coming in and out, uh, Luca, he's an eclectus parrot. So just uh, <clears throat> hopefully uh, it won't distract too much. Uh, this is a storm surge map of Pensacola Bay. And the reason this is important is because it tells you Pretty much most of what you need to know about how Luna selected where on Pensacola Bay he was going to set up his first colony, his first settlement. His directive was to move inland pretty quick. So he needed easy inland access. So he couldn't really settle on any of the barrier islands or on the peninsulas that would make for slow travel. But in addition, he needed to be able to see the mouth of the bay from wherever he settled, which means that he probably would need to be literally within sight of that uh, passage. The bay mouth has actually moved westward um, over time. So it's not in where it was today, or not then it wasn't in the same place. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he also needed high ground, which theoretically would keep them out of danger from any flooding and storms, which didn't, well, they didn't die on land. Uh, people in the ships definitely had loss of life, but up on this peninsula where they ended up settling, uh, they were largely able to survive, even though most of their structures probably got blown down. We had Hurricane Sally come ashore 
just this past uh, uh, fall. And so once again, Pensacola was in the bullseye of a large hurricane. So I can tell from personal experience that, you know, a lot of these trees just drop right over uh, in, the, in the face of these winds. Anyway, so he needed high ground and deep water, and that's precisely what he got right there on the manual point. So what you're seeing there is a photograph or a satellite photo of Pensacola Bay. And you see that little blue blob. I'll enlarge it. This is what I call the Tristan de Luna Archaeological Site District. Um, every site associated with the Luna Expedition is within that blob. The first to be found was in 1992, uh, the shipwreck of the largest ship in the fleet. Um, we think it's probably the San Juan de Ulua. Yeah, was located, a galleon was, was sunk there. And that's what actually led ultimately archeologists to focus efforts here in Pensacola specifically. In 2006, follow-up work by the University of West Florida led to the discovery of a second ship, which we think is called the Jesus, um, or I certainly do. In 2015, uh, happenstance encounter of pottery of the right time period in a recently cleared house site that was reported to us ultimately led to the discovery of the Luna settlement. Um, and then finally, after we found the site on land, we knew that those two shipwrecks were not just randomly offshore. And so we began doing survey inland or you know, toward the land in the shallower water. And the third shipwreck popped up in 2016 in the summer. We are still, we meaning the, the team down here, we're still doing survey to find more. All right, so there's the, uh, an aerial view by drone of what Emanuel Point looks like. It's got a railroad track that loops around it, but uh, otherwise the, the terrace is in pretty good shape. It's about 30 feet above sea level. Um, and you can see the view from uh, the Emanuel the Point site uh, right there on the bottom. So it's, it, it fits the textual descriptions in the documents. Uh, the document, the Viceroy wrote that, um, that Luna had told him that the bay opens up to three leagues in width right in front of where the Spaniards are. Um, and it talks about the fact that they were on a high point of land overlooking the water. I and others had long suspected Emanuel Point might be a good spot for the, for the site, but it had gone unnoticed until 2015. Uh, even, even some field work had been done there back in the 80s and only turned up sand tempered plain pottery, most of which was native, but some of which turns out now we know was Spanish olive jar. I'll show you pictures of some of that. Hmm. All right, anyway, so just briefly, I wanna to touch on some of the uh, wreck remains because that's actually, for us terrestrial archeologists, it's actually quite interesting to see the amazing preservation you get. Uh, I even learned how to scuba dive in 2013 in order to go down and actually touch the vessels, touch the timbers and, you know, it's quite, quite an amazing experience. It's only in 12 feet of water for the first two wrecks, uh, six feet, six to eight feet for the third one. Anyway, these are images that show sort of the outline, the excavations, the Emanuel Point 1 wreck was the galleon up top, Emanuel Point 2 down below. Um, it's been, both of these have been backfilled and so they're no longer uh, visible. They're all nicely protected because of course we wanna keep them in good shape. These are just some images that show the diving platform, uh, the old one at least, I think. No, that's actually the newer one, I believe. Anyway, um, you can see some of the images of our student divers. This is a program at University of West Florida where we engage our undergrads and our grads in both terrestrial and maritime archeology. span And the Luna expedition has given us an amazing opportunity because not only are we digging on sites that are close to each other, literally everything off the shipwrecks is the exact same stuff that's on the land site. So we can wave at each other across the, the water when the divers are out on their platform. And we're digging up pottery of the exact same time period, the exact same culture and owned by probably the exact same people. These are some images again, there's a, a gun carriage, there's a big cauldron, a copper cauldron they would have used to cook their meals or perhaps to reduce tar and, and heat it up to caulk the ship. There's a stone cannonball fitted uh, to what they call the pedrero, which is like a, a stone throwing cannon. Anyway, we have quite a few of those. Those were made on the fly when they needed them. They had hammers specially for making cannonballs out of rock. Uh, another really amazing find off the wreck was a breastplate here. Um, every ship carried at least a small supply of breastplates of this sort, armor for the crew if they ever got into a scrap with a, another um, ship. Uh, although this may have been a personally owned piece because it seems to be sort of fancy. And you can see here the uh, crossbow shafts that were found on the wreck and the crossbow bolt tips, uh, four of which were found in the bow of Emanuel Point One, but I'll show you, we've actually found 
seven or eight of them on the land site. And they're the same type. They're copper and they're made out of, uh, they're presumably made in Mexico. The ones from Spain are made out of iron. The ones in Mexico were made out of copper in this period. And the crossbow would, would basically go out of fashion as a weapon of war around 1570 to 80. And so this was literally the last Spanish expedition um, that had substantial use of, arc of, um, of crossbows. Come on, Luca. Okay, and this is the wreck, uh, the anchor rather from the wreck, manual point one being pulled up uh, both in the field and then on display. Uh, you can actually see it here in the museum. Here is uh, some other examples. These are Aztec uh, pieces. This is a head pot, a face pot that's painted, uh, made out of red uh, material. And then you can see obsidian blades that were, it, it may have been part of weaponry brought by the Aztec warriors. However, the Spaniards quickly realized that these little bladelets could be used for shaving and other things. So we actually do see them as part of Spanish material culture at the same time. So even though I'm showing you a picture of these using these, um, these Aztec warriors using traditional uh, weaponry, that may not actually have been, they may have actually been using Spanish swords and things like this. It's hard to say. Documents really don't tell us that much. Okay, and here's some Spanish ceramics, the really big pieces off the wrecks. Uh, Spanish olive jar was the standard liquid transport. Um, even though they're called olive jars, they were more often than not used for wine and vinegar and water and olive oil. Uh, olives were normally shipped in barrels and boxes, um, not in olive jars. Anyway, these are some of the examples of, uh, of ceramics off the ship. We get the exact same types on land, but of course ours are busted up into lots of small pieces compared to the ones off the shipwrecks. So um, you can also see some of the resin on the inside of that one over the top left. Uh, it's a, a sort of a, a pine or conifer resin that's used to water seal the inside of the ones that held wine. Some of the amazing wooden preservation, you see a couple of, a spoon, um, heard probably a personal spoon. Uh, possibly part of an in musical instrument, a little tuning peg, um, and a leather shoe sole, uh, probably uh, a man's shoe sole. To, it looks today, that would be a woman's shoe, I guess, but uh, back in that era, that, that may have been a man's shoe. Anyway, and olive pits as well. This is our, certainly my favorite object. Um, it is an ivory manicure set that was found. It actually got sucked up by the dredge from Emmanuel Point Two. Uh, and survived. We're only missing the little ear, earwax spoon that probably got lost. But ultimately, it's made of ivory, and you see the little hole on the left that uh, is actually a whistle. So somebody, one of the students finally figured out when they had it in the lab that it might be a whistle, so they put their mouth up, and it, it sounded for the first time in 450 years. Wow. Really, really cool stuff. Awesome. And this just shows the excavations of Emmanuel Point through, uh, 2, uh, just some of the structure. Um, mapping, it's, it's its own science to do all this work with the uh, timbers of the ship, uh, partly because shipbuilding in that era was not well documented. That was not something they did, at least not to the level an archaeologist wants. And so we in the modern era are actually learning more about 16th century shipbuilding techniques and the history of shipbuilding via archaeology, more so than via documents. So this kind of work actually contributes to the global understanding of the evolution Technology. And there's a few more pieces here. What I really want to move on to, though, uh, is the Luna site. So the Luna settlement site. So this is the settlement site uh, shovel test survey. You see that little dark blob in the middle. That's actually 70 or so shovel tests that were dug uh, by us in the space of, I think, five days. Um, the, the house that had been demolished at that spot that produced the evidence of some olive jar and some Spanish majolica or tableware, uh, it was gonna be built into a new house within a matter of days. And so uh, we were able to get permission from the landowners who gave us opportunities to go out and dig as many holes as we could. So we took full advantage of that. Afterward, when they'd begun building the house, um, the next year we spent basically a full year, the Archaeology Institute here actually we dug a, close to a thousand shovel tests over the core of something like 50 acres, basically looking to bound the site, that found limits, how big it was, um, how much was associated with it, and maybe see if we could find something about the depth of the deposits and what was there. Um, so the artifact distribution, this is just a map that shows a hex pattern. Um, 
And it, what this is, is density. It is the weight by area. So no matter whether we dug a lot or a little in an area, this shows the average weight of olive jar per square meter. Uh, and so that map shows that we're looking at, you see the higher area of the terrace is the darker zone in the topo map. That's up to the upper right. That's a very level high 30 foot, well, 29 feet above sea level terrace. And then there's a sloping area that goes down and you can see we also have artifacts there. But olive jar is only one category of 16th century artifacts. So if you look at others on the upper left, you see lead glazed coarse earthenwares, which are 16th century, basically cooking wares. Uh, carrot head nails. Uh, these are in the shape of a carrot, C-A-R-E-T. Um, and that type of nail has been found on uh, expedition or sites from the Coronado expedition in the 1540s in the desert Southwest, but it's never been found in San Augustine from the 16th century here in Florida. So it looks like the Luna expedition was the last to make use of these things, uh, this particular shape of nail. Um, so we've, we've got them all over the site. They are thought to be horseshoe nails. Uh, Luna came, it's, it's in, it doesn't look like the traditional horseshoe nail, but that's what they think in the, in the desert Southwest based on context. They have been found embedded in 16th century horseshoes and we've got them all over the place. And Luna had 250 cavalry and 250 uh, infantry. So it makes sense we would have a lot of them. Anyway, you can also see the majolica, which is the tin enameled and sometimes painted uh, tableware, basically what they ate off, and then the Aztec ceramics as well. So, by the way, I should point out, it seems that the Aztec ceramics do not mean Aztecs were using them. Aztec ceramics were simply part of the typical kitchenwares of any mid-16th century Spaniard living in Mexico City and then that vicinity. So, New Spain had an emergent sort of hybrid material culture that wasn't strictly Spain Spanish. Okay, let's see. So here's an overview that just gives uh, details about um, Santa Maria de Ochuce. Ochuce was the native name for the bay and for a, a native town that was found during the Soto era. But when Luna arrived, um, the population in that vicinity of native groups was pretty sparse, so, but they still stuck with the name. So this is the town, uh, as you can see some details about it. The most important thing for our purposes here is to see that the population levels fluctuated at the site. And why is this important? Well, we had 1,500 people that we now know were spread out over about 31 acres. But as the site dwindled in size, as the people left and then eventually came back, but then they quickly started shipping them off, we ended up with a smaller and smaller population over time. So a year after they first arrived, you know, the population was considerably less than a half of what they originally had. So my suspicion, and I think the archeology span bears this out, is that the site contracted in size. And I've been looking at distributional information that I'll show you in a moment. Um, all right, let's proceed. In the mid 16th century, the Spaniards were beginning to lay out their towns in a grid pattern. That was typically the way that they did things. Um, you can actually see a 1561 map of a different town in Argentina of today. Um, but one was drawn up for Luna's expedition, and we know the numbers from a letter from the Viceroy. Uh, he said there would be 140 house lots, 100 uh, lots just for people who were going to reside there, and 40 lots for public buildings like the church and the plaza and the government house and the governor's house, that kind of thing. Um, and you can see that the plan of a fully realized city was very real. So in other words, you can look at a 2017 view of Ciudad Mendoza in Argentina down below Google Earth. And up top, you can see the original plan. Literally, that's the same plan that they set up in 1561 on paper. Hmm. Of course, Luna's expedition didn't actually succeed and therefore that never really happened. However, one of the big questions I have is, was the original Luna settlement actually laid out where the trees cut, where the um, roads laid out prior to the hurricane and then after the hurricane, to what extent did the surviving settlers maintain that layout? Or did they just abandon that and sort of cluster around the plaza? Um, that's part of what archeology span may tell us because honestly, there's really no documentary evidence that tells us one way or another. Uh, here's another example that shows how the Luna settlement might have looked like. This is a Ciudad La Palma um, in Panama of today. Uh, and you can see little structures, little plots of land, some houses would be, or multiple ones per lot. 
uh, and the streets, of course, divided the lots. One of the goals of our excavations are to find the original or the, the uh, original grid system to see if they laid it out on a grid north, south, east, west, or if it was laid out in a grid with respect to the landform, which was more tilted. Anyway, I'll show you some of that in a second here. Uh, if you take the distribution map of where the artifacts are found that we found archeologically using our shovel test survey, and then you lay over that an area of land that fits the typical lot size for 140 lots laid out in grid, a grid work of four uh, squares, four lots per square, uh, five by seven grid pattern. Anyway, if you do that, that rectangle nicely fits over the distribution of artifacts that we have. So based on this, based on the dense concentration of artifacts over toward where the water was in a little kind of sinkhole spring down there, this is a projected, very, very hypothetical projection of how the Luna settlement might have looked like. Now, I don't think this grid pattern probably lasted all the way to the end, um, but it may have, but certainly the main core area next to the spring and where the boat landing uh, pathway probably joined the site, that definitely seems to have been occupied a very, very long time because that's where most of the artifacts and the features that we're finding are located. They're more densely distributed right there. And so if you look at this, this is, again, just purely a very hypothetical layout. Um, the laws of the Indies that were published a decade and a half or so later specified that port settlements were to have their plaza, their church, their public buildings near the port, near the water, not in the center of the town. And so based on the artifact distribution and the terrace and the textual accounts, that's sort of where I currently at least think we're looking at the central core area. And that's what we've been spending most of our time on at the field school. So one of the questions then, of course, is if they laid out the grid, did they build houses of this sort? These are 16th century uh, literal drawings of buildings in Veracruz and in St. Augustine uh, and in Santa Elena, up where they eventually did establish a Spanish colony in 1566. So this shows, if you'll note, there's planks, there's nails, rows of nails, uh, thatched roofs, um, various other aspects. The point is, is that all of these structures would have left post holes in the sand, and all of these structures would have required quite a few nails. And so we do have nails in great abundance. These are all wrought iron nails of various sizes. Um, but presuming they left the place, maybe burned it, maybe left the structures to rot, uh, it's possible at least that we can use the distribution of nails in the ground to lead us to where we might eventually find postal patterns that'll tell us the size and shape and configuration of any structures they built there. Because we know they built structures because the texts actually count, uh, describe that. Now, uh, most of this expedition was military. These guys were not coming to stay. They were actually coming to move into the interior. And so you can see here, the way a typical military company was organized each of these little groups of about half a dozen soldiers would form a mess unit called a camarada. And each one of these uh, groups would camp together and cook together and distribute themselves in their campground. And they would be using art or uh, structures like this, tents and lean-tos, typical mid 16th century European armies traveled on the landscape just like this. So when the army set up camp, is that what persisted? over time as they didn't move inland, as they stayed in the, in the camp? Or was the layout of the settlement into the grid and the structures being built for the grid pattern ultimately what they settled on? Or was it a combination of both? Or did it, you know, one succeed the other? So that's honestly what the documents don't tell us, but I'm hoping the archeology span will tell us. It'll tell us more about what we're actually looking for. Uh, let's see, okay, so structures like what I just showed you before, are known from Florida. Uh, this is the Fountain of Youth site, which is just north of modern day St. Augustine. And over here is Santa Elena. Uh, and you can see here the pattern of posts that were found at Santa Elena for these rectangular structures on plazas. That's what I'm looking for in the field, looking for patterns of post holes that'll tell us something about the context of where the people lived. And therefore, then we can look at questions of like food debris in the kitchens, food debris at indoors versus outdoors artifact breakage, everything we can learn about Luna's expedition. So for that reason, we've been digging there for many, many years now, uh, four years, four straight uh, summers, 
last summer, of course, we went there due to the pandemic. These are our crews. Uh, just to show you, when I looked at the shovel test data, you can see here the site, that's the grid pattern I'll show you here momentarily. Um, the central part of the grid is the left part of the upland terrace. And if you see here, the greatest weight and diversity of Spanish cooking wares and tablewares is precisely in that core area of the site. The same pattern exists for the wrought iron fasteners, the nails and spikes, etc. And the arms and armor as well. We have a dense concentration of little lead shot, um, most of which seems to have been brought along for hunting purposes. We also found lots of evidence that they were casting bullets right there on the spot for their arquebus weapons. And you can see the crossbow bolts, et cetera, are all mostly densely concentrated at that central area and also at a, a little warehouse area up to, well, not a warehouse, but a sort of a outpost, a guard post in the northeast corner of the site there to the lower left, lower right. We also find uh, basalt, mano, and metate fragments, which are pivotal for grinding corn and making tortillas. So ultimately, since they came from New Spain, their diet was a blend of Mexican foods, Aztec foods, as well as Spanish. And so we find these things where they were processing the food. So again, all of this seems to lead to that area being a real dense concentration. One of the reasons we're going really slow on this project is because of course, this is the, this is a very historic site. This is literally the first multi-year multi European settlement in the continental United States. There is no earlier one that lasted for more than one year. So this is a very important site. So we're kind of taking our time. One of the things we've taken up doing is mapping every single artifact where it's found. So we point plot them all in depth and, and horizontal location. And what you see here, one of our grad students has plotted all of these in to create sort of a cloud that shows where they all bioturbate down to. And also it shows us which ones mend with each other so she's been able to, for example, find out of hundreds and hundreds of olive jar pieces, she's found that most of them belong to, I think, three or four olive jars, and she's reconstructed parts of them. And she even found olive jar sherds in a post hole that we radiocarbon dated that mended with other olive jar sherds scattered around on the surface of the ground, which means that the olive jars all broke in some sort of an event prior to the construction of that structure, probably in the hurricane, at least is my guess. And this is an example of some of those. Those are these olive jars that came in two sizes, the large size and the small size. And there's one of the small size that she's glued together and is holding the pieces together. Um, takes a long time to take these pieces and put them together, but since they're plotted, we know exactly where they all came from and you can actually create a network. She's doing a thesis on this really nifty work. And very importantly, uh, this shows you uh, what we've come up with after, what is that, six or seven units uh, these are two by two meter units. Um, and so ultimately we have a pretty broad area and you're seeing here profile photographs of post holes that we've been able to identify. The one in the very center feature 3008, we got radiocarbon uh, date right in the mid 16th century from the wood, the burned post is actually in there. It had a nail in it uh, and uh, it had olive jar and those olive jar sherds mended with that swarm of broken olive jar all around. So if you look at this, it is at least a, it is leading me to think that if we continue to excavate there and we will be there this summer, I hope, um, I'm hoping that we'll end up with a linear pattern that'll eventually lead us to the identification of one of the one or more of these structures from the Luna expedition. Because of course, finding artifacts does not necessarily, I mean, even though we've got the densest concentration of uh, 16th century art Spanish artifacts anywhere, including in St. Augustine, St. Augustine, uh, spatially was smaller than the Luna expedition because Luna brought more people. He regretted bringing so many people because of course they starved quicker, uh, but nonetheless, that's, that's the reason for the size of our site. We have a few really nice trash pit type features. This is a monster trash pit that was stuffed with 16th century uh, barrel bands that have been broken and partially reworked and smashed native ceramics, Spanish, um, uh, Spanish ceramics, uh, all sorts of things, which you'll see examples of. Here's a profile view. I think what this may have been is a hole they dug in the ground and they stuffed a barrel in it, like as some sort of a cool storage right below ground. It's not a barrel well because it didn't go any deeper. You'd have to go 20 feet to make a barrel well here. Um, but you can see here that it was densely packed. Um, and so we've got 
in this pit, lots and lots of evidence of what they were eating. We've got a uh, deer, a deer antler fragment. We've got shells. We've got all sorts of food remains. We've got ceramics and wire. And anyway, I'll, I'll show you more examples. All right, so just to kind of walk our way through a few of the artifact categories, these are pieces of Spanish majolica. These are 16th century varieties. Um, and we find them, you know, in, in I think they're maybe two or 3% of the total ceramic assemblage. So all this is, is the tablewares, stuff used on the table. Everybody probably ate off tables or at least out of plate, but a lot of the soldiers may have simply used wooden plates. So we don't find those archeologically, but when we see this stuff, uh, they weren't expensive, but they were probably rare. And therefore the dense concentration of this material, this majolica uh, in the core area of the site may belie the fact that most of the officers and the officials were living there. Uh, these are uh, coarse earthenwares, the olive jar you saw before. These are cookwares that are lead glazed. Uh, <laughs> they were cooking in lead glazed ceramics, which you know made for poisonous food, although they didn't really have that sense of it. Uh, there's some Aztec uh, artifacts. These are uh, graphite black on red. When we found these, we actually that shirt right there, the one on the upper right, when we found it, that's when in the field that first uh, day or one of the, that first uh, dig, uh, when I saw the shiny sparkles of that graphite and that weird pattern and the bright red paint and the weird paste, I knew that not only did we have a 16th century site, but we had Luna because Luna is the only 16th century conquistador to arrive carrying Aztec warriors from Mexico. Uh, and everybody, of course, had, was living in Mexico City when they left, including the Spaniards. There's a spindle whirl and a possible brazier leg, we're not really sure, but those things came up off the site as well. Uh, there's the mono fragments and the obsidian blade that we found on the land site, which matches those that we found, uh, that were found on the uh, shipwreck site. Uh, nails, there's a door hinge, a little cotter pin like hinge. We found several of those, but they were apparently nailed into uh, board or wood so that you could sort of hang them on loops. They've been found hooked together like that so that they could be used as hinges. <coughs> uh, the spikes get pretty big. This one's as big as your forearm down there. They had wrecked ships right offshore. So they probably scavenged the remnants of those ships to use uh, to build structures, etc. They even built two small burgantines uh, right on the shore in order to go inland up the Alabama River to the Nanipacana site. Uh, these are weapons. Uh, over there is the co copper crossbow bolt tip. You can see six of them. We found um, another one that's made of iron very recently in the lab, but I haven't actually inserted it. Lots and lots of lead shot of various sizes, uh, full one ball shot for arquebus, as well as the multiple shot like shotguns for the same thing. And you can see the sprue from them casting on site. Uh, and these little fired clay balls, which do not seem to be marbles, they may be, and this is hypothetical, but they may be what the Spaniards described as bodoques, which were used as crossbow shot. So they would use a little pouch and they'd use the crossbow to fire these little things at birds. So they wouldn't use a full-fledged crossbow bolt with a copper tip. They just knock the birds down with these little uh, clay shot. Uh, these are some other artifacts. Uh, mail, we have chain mail fragments. Uh, Really amazing stuff. You can see some of them better in the x-ray images. We have brigantine armor, which is, or brigandine armor rather, which has brass rivets with iron plates that was sewed on the inside of a fabric. Um, uh, anyway, gambesons, uh, coats of armor, essentially. Um, the little rivets may have come off of a Morion helmet. I always envision Tristan de Luna banging his head on a tree, being frustrated that nobody was wanting to go inland. These are some other objects, uh, personal items, clothing. Uh, we have tons and tons of these little aglets. They're lacing tips, like your shoelaces, but they're made out of brass. And that's how they sewed their clothes together. The sleeves would be sewed on, the pants would actually be sewed to the, to the, um, to the shirts. We do have buttons, a hook and eye, and also sword belt fragments, which is what they hung their sword scabbards on. They would have a belt, and then there'd be a little thing with dangling brass fittings like that uh, and a leather strap. These are some of my favorite objects here. You see a little improvised brass wire finger ring and a bale of that very same wire that we found in that trash pit, um, un unfit, you know, lost apparently. Uh, lots of straight pins made out of brass, a little thimble made in Nuremberg, Germany. That's apparently the thimble making center in the mid 16th century. A little bitty sheet silver star, which was made 
everything that I'm reading and from what I've interpreted from other sites of this period suggests this may have been from a penitential flail. It would be a flail that a person would use for personal penitence. They'd flail themselves with knots, but they'd have three or four or five of these little silver stars to create a little more penitence mm -hmm. uh, or penance <laughs> in the process. Uh, and a little bitty brass horse that was found this last uh, excavation time. Uh, not much guilt left, but it probably belonged to someone of means. Some of my favorite artifacts here, this is the one of the uh, scale weights used on a balance scale by probably the treasurer. It's a 10 Castellano weight. It weighs exactly 45.1 grams, if I'm remembering right. Um, and that's exactly 10 Castellanos. Um, it was used for precious metal measuring. And the only person that would have had one of these sets of weights who could have lost it was the treasurer. And that's probably whose house or office we were digging in. And there's a little nozzle there that we are pretty sure is, a, is an enema pump nozzle. Uh, that is the operating end of an enema from the mid 16th century. Mm. Uh, that was part of the medicine of the day. <laughs> and from y'all's perspective up in North Georgia, this is probably the more important one. We now have an assemblage of 16th century beads that were in the warehouse and all over the site that never made it to the hands of Native Americans during the Luna expedition. Mm. So, you know, there's been a lot of guesswork as to what the post Hernando de Soto expedition bead assemblage might have looked like. Uh, for example, the Nueva Cadiz beads up on the upper left were often thought to have gone out of use by 1550 or so. Well, they didn't. <laughs> At least for the Luna expedition, this is precisely what they brought. Uh, seven layer chevrons and Nueva Cadiz beads and a range of other types of smaller beads. Uh, we've even got some cut copper sheeting that I think was probably improvised uh, trade goods. Remember, these guys were starving. And when the, the, the food didn't arrive and they had so many people, they were basically desperate to trade with whoever, whatever Native American group would trade with them. So there's documents that actually talk about the fact that they're bringing these gifts out to gain the goodwill. But my suspicion is that they probably traded whatever they could to get food. And 200 of these guys spent almost six months living in Gordon County, Georgia. So that just so happens to be where the densest concentration of mid 16th century Spanish glass beads is in all of Georgia. So I'm, my suspicion is most of that material that came off the Kusawati River, some of it may be from DeSoto's expedition, which went through there very briefly, but my suspicion is most of that material came from Luna's expedition and therefore came from this particular site. Mm. Anyway, that's, that's a, at this point, just speculation, but it's uh, it seems to fit the evidence. All right, <laughs> um, a, a kind of a whirlwind tour. That's a couple of web pages that you could go to. Um, we have a blog post site, uh, site where I've written a whole bunch of blogs with quite a bit of information, and then a faculty web page which has a lot of information on the on the uh, settlement as well as on the Luna expedition in general. So. It is an ongoing project. Um, we have a field school this summer. We should start probably in mid-May that will run for eight weeks. Um, and so hopefully there'll be more, more to come from this site. Um, it's in the middle of a residential neighborhood. So we always have to keep on top of pipelines and road constructions and people planting trees and things like this. But uh, we have a good relationship with the neighbors. And so I'm, I'm hoping we'll continue to learn more about this amazing site where 1,500 16th century Spaniards camped for two years. All right, uh, any <laughs> questions? I'd be glad to entertain. I, I don't know if I ran out of too much time, but. Oh, no, thanks, John. That was really, really great. Uh, I really appreciated it. We do have a couple questions. The problem with that is that I, my internet connection didn't work out so well, so I actually dropped twice. So I can't even see the questions now. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think one of the questions, yeah, Manny, do you have access to the questions? I, I do. Um, yeah, you just want to read them one at a time? Okay. From, uh, from Anna, is there evidence, the first question, is there evidence of obsidian trading between the Aztecs and Spaniards? Yes. Well, let's put it this way. Um, obsidian is indeed found archaeologically in 16th century Spanish contexts. And uh, I believe Russ Gauranek, I can't pronounce his last name, is doing actually work on, on some of this. Um, if I'm remembering right, uh, there, is, there is some 
work go no, 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 you know what? It's not that. It's Robert Jackson, a uh, historian in Mexico, is working on the project of obsidian use by 16th century Spaniards. That's right. Anyway, the point is, yes, there's textual evidence that indicates that obsidian blades were indeed in the possession and ownership of Spaniards. Um, and there's text accounts, I think, that refer to them being used as razors. Uh, I mean, it's a good coupling, cutting implement. And archaeologically, they are found, for example, in locations that don't necessarily seem likely to have had indigenous uh, weaponry or tools that were used by Aztecs. Um, Anyway, that's, we have four blades, four blades? No, uh, less than that, but several blades off the Emmanuel Point One shipwreck. Um, however, we had Aztecs with the expedition. So theoretically they could have been owned by them. Um, we do have one little tiny obsidian blade from the terrestrial site right in the middle of that, what I think is the treasurer's house. Um, so yeah, the answer, the simple answer is there seems to be evidence that obsidian was at least for a short time utilized to some extent by the uh, native or by the Spaniards that were settled in, in New Spain. It's a very hybrid material culture. Thanks. Uh, from uh, David, uh, he asks, What's, what purpose did the Aztec natives serve in the expedition? Were they captives? No, they were, uh, they were Christian converts. They wouldn't have let them out if they hadn't been. Um, in Mexico City, they came from two barrios, two, two neighborhoods, uh, Santiago Tlatelolco and Mexico City proper. Now they're all in right in downtown Mexico City. Um, they were under the spiritual administration of the Franciscans and Dominicans and Agustinians in various quarters of the city. Anyway, the point though is that um, these were people who in Mexico City in the mid 16th century were part of the indigenous population um, the Spanish tributary system had labor demands, but they were, they weren't enslaved, but they were, the, the communities through their native leaders were obligated as a part of the conquest to provide workers for various tasks. Um, and, then, and then they were paid for their work. So in other words, it, but it was obligatory work. The way we understand that this deal worked was that the Viceroy offered the men who came along on the Luna expedition, the opportunity for their families to be exempted from labor requirements back in Mexico while they were on the expedition. They weren't paid, so they came voluntarily. And in fact, they were nobles. They were in the, in the original Nahuatl text, it's called, they call themselves uh, Mexica Tenochka Mexica or something like this. So the point is, is that it's not just common everyday uh, Mexican Indians, Aztec Indians, it's actually nobles who were warriors and principales or principal Indians. And therefore, one theory that one of my students, one of my current grad students is, is beginning to think about at least is the possibility that the Aztec culture was in part revolved around sort of a warrior ethos and warrior advancement. And in the mid 16th century, those opportunities had gone away for most young men. And so it may simply be that the opportunity to go on this expedition was something that might have appealed because it gave them an opportunity to be warriors for the Spanish in a, in a foreign land without obviously having to just kind of live out their lives in the peaceful, relatively peaceful area around Mexico City. One other thing too is the Spaniards who went on the Luna expedition had been advised by four Indian women who came out on the DeSoto expedition as captives those women said several things, one of which was bring enough food so that you don't ever have to rely on the Indians for food. But I think probably one of the reasons they brought Aztec warriors was that they wanted a group of people that were not Spanish, perhaps to be part of their, their mission, their emissary group. You know, In other words, if they saw other North American Indians, Central American Indians with them as they approached, it might make the first contact easier. Luna, the Luna expedition came after the new laws of Spain, which was 1542-43, when they outlawed Indian slavery, they forbade any sort of uh, taking or thieving. I mean, it didn't mean it didn't happen. It just means it was now illegal. So the point is that Luna came to the Southeast on a mission to evangelize, to make good diplomatic contacts and to negotiate. And so the Aztecs may have been a part of that overall strategy. Now, the funny thing is I have zero 
reference to the Aztec warriors doing anything on the expedition. None of the accounts I have even mention anything about their presence except one letter that the nobles wrote, the warriors wrote to the governor saying, please let us go home, we're starving. And another one, same tenor by the, the craftsman that he brought, the other Aztec craftsman. And the only other reference to the Aztecs is the viceroy who says, you know what, you may as well send them home. They're not doing anything other than eating food uh, on the expedition. So again, I don't, I don't know if it was actually that they were used. I don't even know if they were, came as a unit you know, and, and camped together or whether they were distributed out among the various companies and camaradas living with the Spaniards. I do not know. Those are, those are questions that simply aren't answerable by the documents so far. Maybe we'll get lucky and find some testimony from one of them that went back to Mexico and brought a lawsuit and complained or something. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, Linda Balco was wondering how long did it take for supplies to sail to the settlement? Wow, the first expedition took, uh, oh boy, almost two months because they were going slow and they first time they'd done it. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think we're dealing with something on the order of a couple of weeks. I could be remembering it wrong. Um, I've been doing a lot of research on Gulf ship traffic and the routes that groups took. Um, but I think, I think probably if I had to guess, the quick route, like leaving Pensacola and going down to Veracruz, they might have been able to make it in a matter of less than two weeks um, on sailing vessels. They, they took a weird route because like I say, that to get there, they didn't know exactly where to go except by following the coast of the, of the Gulf up to the just south of where they believe the Mississippi River came out. Then they'd turn southeast and shoot directly toward the Yucatan and they hoped they didn't run into Los Alacranes uh, Shoal before they figured out where it was because it was very dangerous. Uh, Alacran means scorpion. So the scorpion shoals is where they knew they could start, point their compasses north and shoot right to Pensacola Bay. Well, close as they could get. So, so anyway, my impression is once they kind of got their, their bearings, we're looking at a, less than a couple weeks. Thank you. Uh, Cliff uh, wants to know uh, who owns the property where the site is located, and if the site is permanently protected? <laughs> uh, I think the actual bounds of the site, where we have the site, uh, we have something on the order of 70 private landowners. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a residential neighborhood. Um, it's an up and coming neighborhood, particularly the area that overlooks the bluff out into the bay. And so everybody that buys land there typically wants to knock down the old house there and build these huge, massive footprint houses. So it's sort of a gentrification process is going on. Um, the University of West Florida Foundation was provided an opportunity by a local donor to buy the main core, one little parcel on the core area of the site, which just so happens to be where I think Luna himself may have had his house because it's literally on the highest, best part of the bluff right next to the plaza where I think the plaza was. So here's the deal, um, you know, 90% of the site or more is in private hands, but we maintain good, good relations with the neighborhood association and they all seem very willing to help and interested in the project and preservation, as long as they get to continue living there, of course. Um, one parcel has been bought and is under the control of the state. So we're hoping that over time we can gradually get additional parcels, um, but it's a quiet neighborhood and we're trying to maintain a low visibility impact, you know, low impact uh, presence. We don't want to make the neighbors think of us as the people that bring in tours and, you know, uh, are always out digging and sifting. So we're trying to, we're trying to maintain this nice little quiet residential neighborhood. They now call themselves America's first neighborhood, uh, <laughs> which is fun. It's sort of true, <laughs> even though the actual neighborhood today wasn't laid out until about 1900. Um, but still, anyway, so yeah, it's, it's mostly in private hands. There is no local ordinance for this particular area, uh, but we'll see how it works. Um, so far, we're, we're working on the goodwill, of, the voluntary will of people that live there, and there's a good sense of history in Pensacola. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that, honestly, uh, we'll, we'll be able to save a ton of it, uh, even though it won't be you know, formally protected, per se. You Th thank you, John. That, that's all the, the questions I have, but Anna Chitwood does want to thank you 
uh, for your answer about the obsidian. She had no idea that Aztecs had access to obsidian, so she was really happy. Uh, Jack, you you wanted you had a question. Go ahead. When we worked at Kamehameha in in uh, Guatemala, we were allowed to put one by two squares in a whole lot of people's yards. Um, <laughs> are you having it? Are you able to do that sort of thing too? Well, it depends. We we basically. Um, Yes, uh, in, in areas we want to dig, so far everybody's been fine. Um, when we did the shovel test survey, we went around, we had a, a full-time neighborhood liaison, well, full-time, a neighborhood liaison who was hired. So we actually had the guy going around and prepping and talking to people. I think out of all of those 70 landowners, only about five turned us down to dig shovel tests. So we learned how to dig shovel tests in such a way, we tamped down the backfill and we, we preserved the little cube of grass and put it right back in the spot. So we have a good reputation for keeping the yards in good shape. And the areas where we have been focusing our big digs, you know, where we're doing most of our digging, the one lot that has all of those olive jars and post holes, the landowners there go away, go north for the summer. They love our project. They don't give a, they don't care. They, they, they say, go ahead, dig up our front yard. We'll replant in the spring. And then, you know, you can dig it up the next year. So, um, and we own a parcel where we're digging some, but that, since that's protected, I'm actually trying to do more digging on the privately owned lands that could potentially be threatened, you know, by development in the future. So, but yeah, we, we just, we work with the landowners and try to make sure that we don't, you know, interfere too much with their lives. And uh, so far it's worked out okay. I'm really, really pleased with it. Judy Bentz, our former university president and the one who hired me, uh, she, she built this program in Pensacola since 1983. And her dedication to developing public outreach and public archeology span and public information and involving the public um, has made archeology, span you know, a, a commonplace thing in Pensacola. So people don't react negatively uh, unless they just moved in from outside, but they can usually get, you know, locals to tell them, no, no, you know, the archeologists, they're okay. <laughs> Have you, have you taken an opportunity to point out the career path of Dr. Bentz? Uh, she's the first, as far as I know, the first and only uh, university president who started off as an archaeologist. I believe you're right. Uh, I, I haven't heard of another one, yeah. She, she built uh, the she, program from scratch pretty much, didn't she? Yeah, and not only that, she's actually most of us, actually all the historic archeologists who work at the University of West Florida um, started as prehistoric archaeologists and then migrated into historic. Um, Judy was principally interested in prehistoric archaeology and then she came to Pensacola and eventually ended up digging downtown and then be, she became a specialist in historical archaeology. So um, so yeah, she uh, her career is amazing. She's um, She won, I think she's won pretty much every Lifetime Achievement Award so far at least. I think she got the one for the Society for Historical Archaeology a couple years back. She was recently inducted into the Order of Isabel la Católica in Spain. Um, yeah, she's she's amazing. She's quite an inspiration. Um, I've heard her described um, as a force of nature. <laughs> what she turns her attention to gets done. <laughs> I can I can vouch for that. I knew her back in the seventies, and she was already a force of nature. <laughs> <laughs> well, she remains that way. So. <laughs> I feel privileged to, to walk in her footsteps here at, at this program, this amazing program where we've got a really strong archeology span component where I get to interact with both terrestrial and underwater archeologists uh, in this really, really amazing colonial city. Other questions? I don't have any more questions. Nobody's written any more. Well, John, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate you talking to us and uh, sharing your experiences with us. Very fun. I, I always enjoy talking about this stuff. It gets me worked up just to think about it. So <laughs> y'all uh, feel free to visit that website and hopefully there'll be lots more info if you're interested in following up. So thank you, John. Appreciate right. it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. What else? Uh, Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all for attending. Thank yeah. you all for linking in with us. I hope you had a good time. Any other questions? All right. If we have any other questions, ask them now, or I'm going to end the meeting. <laughs>
Thanks, Bill. We appreciate it. You got it. Get a haircut, Bill. Uh, you know, I'm kind of going for the Belushi look, you know. <laughs> I'm, je I'm just jealous. <laughs> I'm not far get behind, behind you. Wings any day now. <laughs> I've had right. both my shots. I'm good. <laughs> I got my first. So. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we'll uh, catch up right. next month. Bye-bye. Thanks.